In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. indeed found no proscenium the voice of everything immersive i'm your host noah nelson this week on the show caesar hawas executive producer of particle inc speed of dark joins us to talk about this incredible new show in las vegas i just saw it two nights ago it seamlessly melds projection mapped characters with a live performance from a talented cadre of performers to tell a beautiful story about magic loss and creativity let me stop here for a second and make clear particle ink speed of dark breaks new ground and will be a touchstone for both fans and creators in the immersive community in the years to come full stop check the show notes get the link and start making plans to see it right now go on pause pause the show i'll be here go go you did it Okay, good. Moving on. We're here. Also joining us is our good friend Landon Zakheim of the Overlook Film Festival, who breaks down Overlook's 2022 immersive offerings, including the immersive game from this year's design team of Escape My Room. But before we get into this week's show, I just want to talk about two immersive community events that are coming up this year, one just a week away here in LA, and another that is going to be the biggest immersive event of the year next weekend here in la is something we talked at length about on last week's show the los angeles immersive invitational eight teams including folks from rogue artist ensemble the speakeasy society spy brunch and the ministry of peculiarities amongst others will be creating brand new immersive work and then sharing it with the world in a 48 hour challenge the preview and showcase tickets for sunday may 15th are on sale now and there's a limited supply so you'll want to act fast. The Invitational is unlike any other event and an opportunity for you to catch immersive work at the very spark of the creative process. Check the show notes for a link to more details, including how to get those tickets. Now, mark your calendars. November 4th through 6th of this year. Those are the dates of The Dig, the Denver Immersive Gathering. Like I said before, this is the one. This will be the biggest immersive event of the year. Part festival, part networking event. The Diggs badge packages are scoped to include tickets to uh, to David Byrne's Theater of the Mind, Meow Wolf's Convergence Station, immersive offerings at the Denver Film Festival, local Denver immersive artists' work, keynotes from industry leaders and parties, at Meow Wolf and Denver's Sports Castle. And yes, when I say they're scoped to include, that means the ticket packages are going to be all-inclusive with all of that in there. And for those who've maybe done stuff already, there'll be some where it's like, oh, you don't have to pay for the stuff that you you know already did, but you don't have to buy a whole bunch of tickets to get it going on, all of it in one, with prices that we hope will surprise and delight. Working really hard on making this be something that people go, wow, all of that for that? Yeah, doing our best here. More on that next month, but mark your calendars now. The effort around all this is led by the Immersive Denver organization with support from ourselves at the Immersive Experience Institute and other partners, including the Denver Center for the Performing Arts Off Center, Denver Arts and Venues, Meow Wolf, the Denver Film Festival, Nonplus Ultra, and the Denver Fringe Festival. That's a lot of folks coming together to make this a spectacular event and indeed a model going forward. All right. Those are your announcements. It's going to be an incredible year now. We've been working on all this for a while, getting it all lined up. And here we are having just come back from Vegas, having uh, checked out Particle Ink Speed of Dark, which is incredible. Uh, having gotten to go into the new Lost Spirits Distillery over at Area 15, which is, it's like, it's like 
the magic castle for burlesque and cabaret performance. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely not what I expected it to be. I, I'm absolutely juiced. Uh, and having got a chance to uh, talk with our friend Troy Hurd over at Majestic Rep, uh, who's prepping Clown Bar 2 over there in Las Vegas's Arts District. Las Vegas's Arts District is really fantastic. I got to say, it puts Los Angeles's Arts District to shame. And apparently it was like based on L.A.'s Arts District. So hi, L.A. What happened? Come on. Let's get it together. Um, but, um, but there in a warehouse at the outer edge of the arts district, the light poets have set up their lighthouse with particle ink, speed of dark. And, uh, this is a game changer. Let's get into it. Out at the edge of Las Vegas's Arts District, which is popping off, and you should really go to it just generally, is a show that I've been waiting years to see. It's Particle Ink, Speed of Dark. It's from the Light Poets. And this has been a long gestating project that mixes performance, storytelling, and the greatest projection mapping you'll see pretty much anywhere. It's right here in Las Vegas, and I'm standing inside the lighthouse, which is the venue for it, right now with Caesar Hawes, who is the executive producer of the show. Caesar, we last time we talked, uh, other than yesterday, mm-hmm. was two years ago when y'all were looking to land this thing. Um, but before we get into all that, um, tell us what the show is, if indeed words can do it just. Oh my God, is that a mecha head? Okay, anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was real, y'all. I'm like, whoa. Robots. Okay, so uh, tell us what this show is, man. So, Particle Ink: Speed of Dark. It's the first live experience from the Particle Ink metaverse. Um, it's set in uh, an abandoned warehouse here in the Arts District in Las Vegas. Uh, follows the story of a grieving artist and his wife, uh, and the um, the sort of arc of the narrative is them learning to find light from within through creativity and imagination to get them through the darkness, ultimately reconciling that within all of us sits equal parts, light and dark. And, uh, you know, the, the beautiful thing about this experience has been that, you know, we sort of have all been collectively going through some pretty challenging times. Uh, and we're just really excited to be like telling this story in a way that is both very personal to us individually, but also, uh, you know, can connect to the collective experience that we're all going through. And the story's kind of broad and mythic, but it's the how this is told, the how this is experienced is what sets it apart from, and and this will sound hyperbolic to everyone listening, but I am sincere in meaning this, unlike anything else I've ever seen as a total package. So what... What are the what are elements here? What are people going to find when they when they when they come in? I, I know I know there's the urge to like maybe not spoil things on one level, but who baby like there's so much in this. It's almost yeah. hard to start deciding where to start picking things apart. Well, you know me, I'm never going to tell too much, but uh, you know the um, well. How about this? How about I start with like where we are, right? The yes. the sort of narrative skin that gets laid on top of all of the sort of specifics in in the sort of execution of the story. Um, there's a dimension that exists all around us that we normally can't see. Uh, it sits somewhere between the two dimensional world of the storyboard and the three dimensional world that we live in. It's called the 2.5th. And, uh, there are various ways to be able to peek into this universe. Um, kids can see it pretty easily. Uh, and the creatures that live inside of this universe have gone by many names throughout the ages. Some people call them angels, some people call them fairies, but they're lumens, they're creatures made of pure light. And uh, here in the lighthouse at particle ink speed of dark uh, is one of the first portals into that world, being able to sort of see um, the the place where the veil between the two worlds is at its thinnest. Uh, And the reason that I bring that up is because Um, we employ all manner of technology to sort of execute the creative here, 
but really it's about the story. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in the kind of work that excites me the most is the work that allows the technology or the, the mechanisms behind telling the story to truly disappear. Uh, and we have this beautiful narrative container that we're able to contextualize the technology and really allow the audience to suspend their disbelief and like truly lose themselves in the world. So it doesn't really become about the projection mapping or the cool AR technology that we're premiering here or uh, even the any individual performer themselves. It's a seamless way that they all come together to tell the story. And you know, to the, the performers, they carry, uh, I think, a lot of the, 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 the weight of giving the audience the freedom to accept what they're seeing as real is the wrong word, but like if you, that, that enhanced imagination of, mm-hmm. of real, because there's a precision to what the performers are doing. And there, there's, there's dance here, there's acrobatics that are close up, which by themselves would be spectacular to see. Like it's not often you get to see someone doing parkour flips like mm-hmm. two feet from your face, unless maybe, I don't know, you're at sleep no more, right? And those, <laughs> that happens there too, right? So it's got that going on, but they're, they're interacting with the Lumen characters, of which there are a number, uh, and so that there's, there's a, <laughs> It'd be like watching Roger Rabbit happen, but be able to actually see the cartoon characters at the same time. And there's even a few things done to like expand things beyond just the walls. This this this, this must have taken. Well, it did take years to come about. So, so yeah. tell us a little bit of the story about how this project came together. Yeah. So um, the the Light Poets originally created this back uh, in 2017 when it premiered at Sundance. Uh, and, um, that's, you know, sort of the, the, I guess the birth of particle, uh, really happened there. Uh, and then, uh, it was a, you know, a long road to the development process of, um, sort of figuring out what is the right scale, what is the right place to mount it. Uh, and, uh, we were very close to opening up in New York, uh, in September of 2020, and uh, like the rest of the world, um, sort of everything came to a grinding halt, uh, and we were very far along in the process. And it was, um, you know, like, what do we do now? How do we bring this? Um, we we want to tell this story. We, we've done so much to sort of lay the groundwork to make it actually happen. And so it then became uh, the sort of experience of like finding the right place like where can we do this in a place that um is sort of primed to experience immersive work uh in the way that we want to tell this story in the way that we want an audience to experience the work um that's got uh enough of a um yeah sort of transient audience that could support it um, as well as like a local community that we can develop a relationship with Uh, and the light poets are based in Vegas Uh, and so it just sort of ultimately made sense that um, that we yeah find a space here that we could you know sort of mount this and play around with it and see what works what doesn't work and really let this become a sort of laboratory for um, you know enhancing the, the things that were going to be happening, you know, in 2020, um, you know, we, we turned so hard to the digital world and everything that, you know, everyone experienced throughout the sort of lockdowns and uh, throughout the course of trying to sort of reimagine how people come together in one space at the same time. Uh, and it's been like really incredible because the ultimately what we landed in is this sort of literal perfect container for the story an, an abandoned warehouse that an artist and his wife have been living in and have sort of been left to their own devices and have sort of created this magical place and have really truly lost themselves uh, in the in the storytelling of um, in the storytelling of both like the the collective experience as well as like the story that we're trying to tell of the artist and his wife. Yeah. And so the um, that's a very long-winded way to get to, <laughs> there's a long-winded way to get to um, 
sitting at the core of all of our thoughts and all the sort of, you know, uh, discussions around like the right place to do it, it, it really was like the story has to still make sense. Yeah. Well, and as an audience member, I can tell you it, it does make sense. Like it, it tracks. And, and for those who may be wondering you know, what the flow is, you know, there's, there's stuff that starts outside and then the audience comes in and there's sort of, there's, there's a number of, of kind of gateways, if you will, to, to bring into a, a, a middle section where there is ex- exploration. So there's this balance between the audience as audience, the audience as explorers, the audience as enablers of the characters in the world. And it all, it all very s- s- happens seamlessly kind of going back and forth between the different roles and, and, and to, to kind of culminating in a, in a grand finale. Um, and, you know, everything is visually spectacular from the static images on the walls to the projections to some of the more technical stuff. Like, mm-hmm. um, you're playing around with AR uh, in, in a couple of different ways uh, and doing some implementations that are, are some of the more advanced implementations I've seen uh, and definitely that I've seen rooted in, in a narrative space. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And there was something you guys did at, at uh, the Ted talks this year mm-hmm. and you showed me some things. I don't know how yeah. far you want to talk about that. Yeah. But like, please. Well, we, um, uh, you know, that's exactly right. The, the, the thing that for me personally, that has been so exciting about like being involved with this project is that, you know, the, um, in some of the work that I've done before, uh, it's really about, you know, sort of really, truly transporting, uh, an audience by way of like the physical experience, you know, surrounding people um, in a in a in an environment that does a, a ton of the legwork in telling the story. And I think you know, there's so many um, experiences that use projection mapping or use AR uh, to sort of envelop physically uh, the audience, but doesn't really actually connect to the audience. Isn't actually trying to tell a story. It's just it's cool. Uh, but it sort of leaves you with this sort of like, so what? And th- that's not like shade towards anyone that's like, you know, that's doing yeah. this kind of work, but it's just, it is. We, we've been, in, we've been in the tech demo mode for a very, very long time. Yep. Uh, and it makes complete sense because people are literally building the toolkits and figuring out the grammar. But if we're going to keep with that metaphor from like, you know, the alphabet to the grammar, this is the first time I've seen sonnets. Mm-hmm in this mode, right? Like well, we've had, very nice of you to say. Yeah, yeah we, we, we've had an alphabet, we've gotten words, a little bit of the grammar, and now now there's complex meaning is being delivered through these mechanisms. Well, and the trick the trick is to let the the technology itself be truly secondary to, to the experience. It's really not about um, putting forward AR moments and saying like, oh, this is the coolest AR experience or, oh, this is, you know, a really cool physical space that I'm in or, oh, the projections are really dope. It's about letting it just, you know, be like, that was a great experience and like letting that sort of sit on its own. And so we opened a TED conference this year, uh, premiering uh, multi-viewer AR, which allows uh, multiple audience members at the same time to be watching uh, AR that um, is sort of all synced up and is uh, sort of interacting with both the projection and uh, live performance. And so it kind of, for me, it answers that so what, right? Because it's not about, oh, there's a cool thing that I'm seeing through a screen. It's about like, oh, I'm watching this amazing, beautiful moment and this story unfold in front of me. Really the technology becomes like an, you know, an afterthought to the experience. Now you've, you've if, if you hope I can say this, you've built the capacity for that into the space right now. It hasn't mm-hmm. been deployed yet, but you, you did just give me a demo of, of what that's, that's like. So that's something that's on the roadmap yep. for the piece within days, within days. Okay. Yep. Within right. days. So, so there's a lot of iteration still going on. Yeah. Like you're open your live and, and you know, the run is set right now through, I think what end of July yep, is, end is, of July, is, yeah. is where things are being sold. But like there's, there's iteration going on here. Yeah. Well, you know, it feels like such a waste to have gone through all of the work that it's taken and all the, the sort of emotional uh, ups and downs of that any project uh, will take, much less one that's trying to come to life uh, in the course of a pandemic. Uh, and so, um, you know, 
I suppose in, in a lot of ways this becomes a laboratory for experimentation and we want to continue to do that. Um, and so, you know, we're not talking substantial changes, but, uh, but I think, you know, there's something really amazing about the opportunity that we've got in being here uh, with an audience that seems to be really down to, to sort of do that exploration with us. And as the technology evolves and, and sort of comes together and, um, you know, we sort of have these aha moments that kind of come out of nowhere where you're like, oh, my God, I didn't really think that was going to work. But here we are. Let's trick that out and do it everywhere. It doesn't need to be just in one little uh, container within the space. We can do that in a whole room. And, and to be clear for everyone listening, these things are all additive, right? Like the, the core of it, the, the performers working with the, the projection mapped characters, like if that's all this was, it would be amazing. <laughs> And now there's all, and then there's all this other stuff that like is revelatory. There's, there's a puppet in this thing. You can get your fortune read by a puppet and like, not everyone's going to do that, but like, it's great. And that's completely untechnical. There's, there's these, you know, interesting little tools and toys in the space that can like reveal other layers of the, the world that's been built here. Yeah. Um, just really just. It, 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 the language starts to, to break down because also I don't I don't want to prescribe anyone's experience going in like the, <laughs> I've been sending you know some videos because he let us all take pictures and videos last night like in little chunks so I've been sending them to people like via text and everyone's going like what the hell is this <laughs> so like freaking out I'm like get here um, well it's like you know it, for you know when in the collaborative process when you're building something there's always this um, possibility that between all the parties involved, the thing that you've been thinking about and uh, sketching and drawing and developing and piecing together, um, when it all finally comes together, um, may look different for each individual than what their expectations were. And uh, the beautiful thing about what the light poets have created here is that like, this is the thing that was in my head. This is the thing that was in the head of, you know, um, Jennifer Tuft and Cassandra Rosenthal, who are the CEOs of Kaleidico, the, the company that's presenting this. But, you know, we all sort of have talked so much about it. And it was that that moment, you know, a few weeks ago when we got through our final um, test audiences and it was just like, ah, oh, yeah, this is the thing. And, and forgive me if this is a little cheesy, but it's, you know, it's like having your like Saturday morning cereal bowl and like just like getting lost and that you know for, for the millennials out there it's like it's giving us muppets it's giving us like transformers it's giving us like you know um he-man and she-ra it's like it's p bringing all of those uh those sort of like full transportive fantasies robust worlds that we lost ourselves in as kids it's bringing that to life in this space and uh i just i really couldn't be prouder of it i think it's i think it's a uh a, a marvel of creativity by a team of wildly talented and impressive people. I, I know there's there's a, an effort being made to keep some mystique around the Light Poets. I'm wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how either how they came together or how you found them, like, you know, your your entry into this project and, and sort of how it all how it all fits in into the, the grand immersive. Sure you know, whatever the hell this is we've got going on. <laughs> yeah, so the, you know, the, the Light Poets are a collective of artists that um, have backgrounds in Cirque and Disney and um, uh, just sort of general theater and um, technicians and, uh, you know, multimedia artists and uh, directors. And they're, they're, you know, just wildly talented wildly impressive and when they when they did the the thing in Sundance was a one room really small experience and it was just so powerful and it was the kind of thing that people kept coming back to and uh, I was at Sleep No More for about eight years uh, leading up to this um, and left uh, the McKittrick um, in 20 the last few years have been a blur, so I don't even know what was what. I left in 2019. In the before times, you left in, in the, the before. I, times. I left yeah. in the before, just yeah. just in the, just before the before times became the now times, yeah. um, uh, and um, 
was sort of approached by them uh, to sort of, you know, how can we help? How can I, you know, how can we just sort of, you know, collaborate in some way? And I came out to um, their studio space here in Las Vegas and what was just going to be a light consulting gig. I saw 30 seconds of the beginning of the experience um, and uh I was just so blown away and I was like, please let me join you on this. I want to develop this with you. Like this is one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. Uh, and it wasn't just because the, you know, the way that technology and performance came together. It was, it was a story that was being told. Uh, and it, it, it took me to a different place that I hadn't been in a long time. It was like when, you know, when in the early days of sleep no more, where we were just like, what is this? Like, this is incredible. You know, like I, I feel fully transported. I feel taken to another time and place. I hadn't felt that in a really, really long time. And then I saw this and I was like, we got to do this together. We got to bring this to the world. Yeah. Uh, the, the friend I came with last night, you know, said like, this is the first unmissable show I've seen in a very long time. Wow. That's yeah. very nice. Yeah. That's very nice so, to hear. Um, and, and, uh, he said that and I'm like, yoink. Uh, and I, I used it, you know, in talking in the, in the newsletter, uh, she wrote this morning, like it's, it's like the, the thing about immersive when it, when it really works is it, and you go and you try and explain it to someone is it, you sound like you're trying to describe your dream to someone and it just, it, it's going to fall you know flat on some level. It's never going to be a, in, as good in words as it was like, while you were, you know, tucked away in bed and, and the images were going. And this really has that in spades. Um, and and yet, despite the fact that there's all this stuff layered in here, all, all of the tech, all the performance, uh, and and structured a bit so that you, you, you probably will miss some things, like, it, coming through. It, like something like Sleep No More, you don't feel even if you didn't get to see everything, you don't feel like, oh, that wasn't complete. What what you get is a complete experience and a little bit of incentive to like, but if I try this, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it was that was that part of the DNA from the start? You yeah, know, you know, those terms? One, one of the things that, um, that I always push really hard for is allowing the audience to have as much agency over their experience. Um, uh, as as we can give them, uh, especially in you know spaces that aren't like crazy big, um, being able to create um, enough spaces and put enough things uh, within the experience that allows people to gravitate towards what interests them the most and try to hold their hands as little as possible. One of my very least favorite things in the world is when I'm going to you know an immersive show and I get stuck in some sort of track that I'm not really feeling and I get the sense of there's something over there that I would rather be seeing and it becomes like it's torture it's literally torture to you know when you're just like I'm not vibing uh and I really I really you know really fought to make sure that 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 was something that we tried to stay away from as much as we can you can always add that in you could always make that a thing but I think we wanted to sort of see what happens if you just sort of unleash people into the space and let them gravitate towards the things that interest them. And then exactly as you say, like, yes, you may get the sense that you've missed something, but like, like life, um, it's still the story that you, you experience that day and that's totally okay. Uh, and we want people to come back, you know, we want them to experience there's, there's so many layers of detail. And I, you know, I think <gasps> even if you looked We're, around right now, there's yeah. probably like, you know, a hundred or so little things that you didn't even notice. I mean, you could spend oh, the I, entire yeah. hour that you're here, um, in, you know, in the experience, um, just reading the lore of the universe oh. that's all over the wall. Oh, you could, you could just sell like a, a daytime lights up ticket to super fans. Once you have super fans and just be like, I'll get one hour to read whatever you want. Forty five ninety five, And, uh, I get a cut if you do that. Um, no, uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, okay, maybe we're, maybe later. we're already thinking about maybe, that. Okay, Noah. Good, right, maybe that's so, already in the plan. But, but I put it in the podcast now. No. <laughs> I need to see the emails. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding everybody. But no, it's like, it's like me reacting to the the mecca head on top of the shipping container like something i did not see last night right. and like instantly setting the tone for the the insanity that was going to be the the podcast i mean there's the the characters are here it's like it's fractal 
It's like yep. it's like it ex- the show exploded and is all over the walls. And then it's happening inside the space, both on the walls and inside the space, and it's just recursive and fractal. And well, you know, it's beautiful. a world. It's a world of light and ink, uh, and that, you know, just when I was when I first was approached about getting involved, and like that was the sort of context of it. You know, you hear a oh, light and ink, and then you kind of don't think about it, and then you're like, wait a minute, light and ink, light and ink, light and ink. Wow. Okay. It's just it's, it's not only is it just a great metaphor. But it's literally what we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah, there's ink <laughs> and there's light. And and so you you mentioned it's the first thing in the in the metaverse of 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 particle ink. Uh what what's some of the ambition here? Right? I mean I don't I don't I don't want to get, you know, too focused on the future or, or where this could go, but what's some of the dreaming and uh, you know, cuz you're clearly thinking that way. Yeah, you know, we when the pandemic happened uh, and we had to sort of shut down even the notion of a live experience, at least for a little while, we really started to turn to the digital experience and, you know, how can we um, build this world out in a way that um, is still authentic to what the aspirations are in the live experience, but that can, that we can bring the story to the entire world, uh, and obviously the you know the the opportunities that sit within um, the conversations that are only in their infancy, I think, in the mainstream around what a metaverse can look and feel like, um, it's baked into the uh, the thinking around like how do we tell this lore? Like this is the 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 world that has been created already that you don't see even in this space. Um, has been the work of the light poets for many years in terms of just like m- massive world building. It's, it's sprawling. And if you were to wander around this space and read the lore that's pasted up all over the walls, I think you would very quickly start to understand the places that we want to go. I can't tell you now, no, but fine. you'll understand the places that we want to go. Yeah. 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 Well, and there's, then there's layers in here. I mean, like, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of, um, mythological and even religious imagery like baked in here you know the, the wife's name is Lilith uh, she's the wife of someone referred to as the creator if you know certain things you know certain things if you don't oh have fun on Wikipedia tonight <laughs> uh, and then come back around and talk to me because you know this is that kind of stuff's my jam and and there's there's the tarot imagery in here uh, I mean literally there's a little tarot card like above your shoulder on my eye line and there's like you mentioned, like the, the Saturday morning vibes. So you get your mecha, you get your cartoon characters, you get characters that are in black and white and characters that are full color and, and just these just, just never forget the puppet. Never and the puppet. forget the interstellar storyteller. Yeah. Well, I mean, the puppet's the first, the first, I mean, <laughs> spoiler, the first thing we met at least last night, yeah. I don't know if that's always, but there's a station, you know, like, and, and, <laughs> and my buddy, <laughs> I know he likes puppets, so I was like, oh, the puppet shows up, I was like, oh, there's a puppet across the way, and like we like, pushed our <laughs> way through all the people, like, there's a puppet! Uh, I mean, it feels like, I don't know, like, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to settle in, like, how I'm going to write about it, and it feels like what would happen if Imagineers were just left to do things with no adult supervision and no one was saying like, we've got to get the IP in here. And like, you know, this is the limit of what you can do. You can't make them do that. And it's just like, there's, it's, it's, if, if that is your jam or even if like, you know, if it's, if it's not necessarily like, there's something, there's something for almost anyone who, who has the, the immersive vibe in here. But more importantly, I think there's something for anyone who likes themed entertainment or who loves, circus arts or um just like choreography or or just wants to see something that they've never seen before like it's 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 in here yeah i mean the i mean i can't you know speak highly enough of the light poets and their creative ingenuity but also the performers my god the performers that we have that are contortionists and aerial artists and crumpers and break dancers i mean it's you know, it's bringing these worlds together in a way that is very seamless and may not um, 
you know, to a listener make a ton of sense. But when you see them come together, it makes complete and total sense. It's, it's it, so seamless. It's, it's a magic so chicken of itself. It, like it, it, they're doing stuff and it feels like it should be impossible. The way they're moving, there's people in this thing that move like the cartoon characters move. There's yeah. certain moments that I wanted to like start cackling with laughter, but I didn't want to freak everybody out <laughs> because of the fluidity of what was happening. That was you? Almost. Uh, I think I did bark once, not like woof woof <laughs> bark like in the Northmen, but just like a, a barking laugh. Um, yeah, no, there's, it's, it's absolutely stunning work. I know I sound like I'm over caffeinated and over sugared and, and, and sleep deprived because I am, but even if I wasn't all those things, I would be this ecstatic and this desperate. Cause like I see something like this and I just want everyone I know or everyone who, who, who knows of this world to like come through so we can further the conversation so we can, we can, we can you know so much of what is possible is in here and and so much of what has been possible but has yet been unlocked is being unlocked in here and it just again you know that's what makes it unmissable is that there you said before you know that if you know if, if you saw this when you were 10 years old say yeah yeah repeat that repeat yeah. that line. I don't, I'll, don't, tell you, I'll yeah. say it again i'll say it again yeah when i was you know i i was quite an imaginative kid uh, maybe more than your average kid, but if I would have seen this when I was that age, I would have, I would have truly believed in magic. I mean, it would, I, it, it would have been something that stuck with me forever. And the truth is, as an adult with the same, with that same imagination, I mean, that's what's so exciting for me about this project is that it makes me believe in magic again. Yeah, that's a, that's a great place for us to land on. Caesar, thank you for spending time with me here of course thank you thank you very much i'm i'm so excited this is here and i'm so excited it's it's it was what i was imagining it was going to be and and more and oh what a feeling well we hope you we hope you'll come back very soon and often i'll be back I'll drag, <laughs> I'll drag people out here no question been a couple of years since they've been in New Orleans, but the Overlook Film Festival is coming back with live in-person festival events this June. Joining us in studio is Landon Zachheim, one of the founders of the Overlook Film Festival, who is here not to talk about films with us, but to talk about the thing that Landon and I talk about all the time, which is immersive experiences. And in this case, the immersive experiences that are going to be at overlook something the festival is known for hey landon hey thanks for uh thanks so much for having me noah uh it's too bad we're not going to talk about films because it's actually in a really amazing year for genre films but um uh, oh there's there's, the there's a great lineup too. yeah i mean I, I recommend i recommend everyone check out check out the film lineup i mean it's just you know like yeah no person you, you know what we're about so yeah i mean i know you know what you're about because the other thing we're doing this episode is talking to folks at Particle Inc. Speed of Dark, and uh, you're coming along with me to go see that. So, uh, Landon's, uh, Landon's yeah, a real one, as we like to say. So, uh, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a good time. I can't wait to check that out. All right. So, what what is Overlook got cooked up uh, this year? Because uh, it's of course, let's start with the big thing. Uh, Overlook is associated, at least in the minds of the immersive fans, with a thing known as the game or the immersive game. So, tell us for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about what that is and its uh, manifestation this year. Yeah, for those who don't know, the the Overlook Film Festival is a four day celebration of all things horror. It started as a site specific uh, type of event in rural locations associated with The Shining in various degrees, either the book, the movie, the miniseries, various versions of it. That's obviously where we get our namesake from. Part and parcel of that inception was to make it an experience-based and community-based film festival. And that's where something called the immersive game kind of rose from. So even from the early days, starting out very small, there had been various uh, side events connected to the film program uh, that sort of were designed to allow you to navigate the film festival in a more unique way to make networking events feel like more unusual or unique or icebreakers and, and to sort of bond you to your fellow 
festival and film and genre fan, be they press, volunteer, industry, filmmaker, tributee, uh, staff, or anybody just kind of uh, in the area, uh, to sort of bond them in a more unique way, have them have a more uh, unusual experience, basically to live a horror movie. We were very much inspired by things like um, the famous ARG, The Beast. That was sort of a lot of film fans' first experience with um, immersive and alternate reality gaming with uh, films and uh, and film-related events. And uh, that kind of had sort of trickled down to to sort of where we um, kind of wanted to create this experience. And so there's been various guest designers each year of the festival and kind of prior versions of it when we became the Overlook in 2017. And even when we moved to New Orleans, uh, starting with the 2018 festival. Uh, so every year is been a different designer. So there's different forms, structures, people like to use it in different ways. We've had people who are more into immersive theater, people who come from the escape room world. And this year is very much from a, a homegrown New Orleans group that is also nationally recognized and does a lot of great work, both in terms of uh, escape room creation, but also in terms of kind of uh, ethics and support within the industry. And that is Andrew Preble and his team at Escape My Room. So they are the designers of, uh, yeah, what we call the Overlook Immersive Game. Uh, I should add that everything this year has sort of been reimagined for a pandemic age. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm able to say post-pandemic age yet in terms of uh, our thinking. Uh, I think we have to say post-lockdown age. But um uh, I think, uh, um, you know, they, uh, it, with their backgrounds are sort of creating this really, um, wonderful and energetic, uh, kind of experience this year that I'll say like, you know, think more malignant than saw, uh, I think coming out of people coming back to live events, besides wanting to know that they're going to be safe and have fun. I think there is this feeling that people want, um, to have this feeling of joy back. And um, and so I think that element is going to be very much uh, a part of everything we do with anything live and immersive this year. I like that thing more malignant than Saw. So also I'm you know going to be very disappointed if there is a gal running around backwards for the entire weekend. No. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, spoiler alert. Spoiler on a malignant. Uh, <laughs> but then again, you know, uh, you know he he was he was at the Met Gala according to uh, Twitter in the past couple of days. Um, who who am I to, to 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 say that that's fake? I can't tell what's going on. I don't go to the Met Gala. Um, so you, you you mentioned you have the the folks down at Escape My Room. Uh, how how did how did that that one come about? I mean, it's, it's a natural fit. It's a little bit like, oh, why wouldn't you have Andrew Preble? Yeah, but, well, but when yeah. we first um, when we first moved down to New Orleans, that year's game designers, uh, I think, first put us in touch. You know, we'd heard that they were a really extraordinary escape room. We went down and we went down there, and I recommend anybody in the area do at least one room at their flagship location because you can tell from the outset, the waiting room, the entryway, like you are immersed from the get go. You go in and you immediately realize, oh. So these these folks get it. They're very much in league uh, with uh, the same kind of idea behind a lot of our favorite escape rooms in Los Angeles and elsewhere that have kind of uh, you know made its way into sort of the conversations of people who trade. Uh, uh, storied info about the best escape rooms around. And I, I definitely think they're, they're a part of that. And so we've been in touch ever since, um, you know, Andrew in particular has an understanding of festivals. You know, he was involved with the Berlin Alley uh, for a minute uh, uh, when he was living out there and he um, has kind of a history with sort of this type of ephemera as well. Um, and uh, even before he became an escape room designer and uh, the year after uh, kind of we met him, his group created a piece in our program called Sane's Bone that we ran in the 2019 festival that was very scavenger hunt based. And it was a, a, a preview of a project they were working on that we were lucky enough to be able to showcase locally. Um, and it's just, uh, I think we're lucky to have um, a great uh, experienced designer just based right in the backyard of the festival. Uh, so it seemed like a natural fit. And they were actually going to do the game for 2020, which was announced. The game they were doing then was very, very different uh, than the one they've designed now. Uh, completely different idea, premise. Uh, it was a very exciting thrill ride. Uh, but, you know, we didn't know where we were at when we had to postpone our festival two months beforehand. Uh, and uh, which was originally supposed to be May 2020. 
Luckily, they were interested in kind of coming back to the festival, very on board with redesigning. Um, uh, as you'll see with all of our immersive experiences, we're very safety led. And uh, they came up with a bunch of ideas and landed on what we're now calling a cursed arrangement, uh, which is very much about a demonic connection uh, involving a local music historian and you, the player. Uh, and um, yeah, I would expect, uh, you know, a number of investigations, uh, texts and phone calls, uh, and uh, very much escape room elements and mini games kind of throughout the weekend. You know, as you know, uh, this type of event is a living thing. Uh, so it's still be unlike some of the other pieces that are, are finished products we're showing in the festival, you know, it's still being designed around the festival schedule and the other festival events. And, 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 and like its exception, it is still very much the type of event that encourages you to as best as possible, meet other people, work with other people, and also, um, engage with the other festival activities. Uh, something new for this year is that uh, it's very much designed around our festival hub. Uh, we were very lucky in that during the pandemic, one good thing that came out of it was this great theater, uh, the Historic Britannia Theater. Uh, they bought a multiplex we used to use as one of our secondary venues and refurbished it. And so that has now become our hub and everything oh, nice. in and around that area. Um, you know, it gets very hot in New Orleans uh, in the past people have had to uh travel uh sometimes quite some distance to do some of the key events and um and so a lot of things are going to be very much about um convenience boundaries uh and and air conditioning <laughs> as much as possible <laughs> um not to get into like a necessarily a spoiler territory and obviously things mm -hmm. are still being designed but you know uh you mentioned safety first you mentioned like a redesign of, of the concept you, you mentioned phone calls and texts and everything. Are there still going to be actors in this one or is this going to be? that? That's a good question. I'll go ahead and say that there are no actors in any of the immersive projects this year. Anything we decided to shy away from close contact indoor performers. It was something it was a decision we made in the Omicron surge in the height of it. Uh, and one we decided to stick to in the same way that even as many local uh, mask and vaccine mandates uh, dissipated, we decided to stick to what we planned on during the Omicron surge. So much like how you have to be vaccinated, boosted and masked to attend festival activities, um, you you will find kind of a, a, a less actor intensive, less close contact intensive style of event this year. So that's very much one of the things we mean by uh, a pandemic redesign. Uh, it, what is unfortunate about that is that, you know, there was a number of things we had booked for 2020, uh, that we had originally wanted to carry over to 2022. And, uh, you know, with all, with all luck, you'll see those in 2023 instead, because they don't quite fit, uh, the parameters that we made the decision to, um, uh, to go with this year. And, you know, a lot of that just has to do with the trans, the transitory times we live in. And, um, you know, the fact that we have people coming in from, uh, even as a small event, there are still people coming in from uh, almost all 50 states. And we have immunocompromised uh, staff and families involved in this festival in our advisory board. And it's very important for us to keep that, those safety standards um, high. So if we're going to hold the festival at all, um, we wanted to mitigate risk as much as possible. I mean, we love immersive theater performers and we'll, you'll, you know, they'll be back at the festival, but they're very much a back burner idea this year in favor of other elements. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a trickiest time to be making anything in any way, shape or form right now. And, and the, 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 the fact that like at this moment, we're all being just left to our own devices to figure out what to do and how to do it. And the data has been removed from us. Like none of us know how many people actually are infected at any point. Like we don't have the same kind of data we had like six months ago. Like they're not testing isn't happening the same way. We're all being left to do our own testing. Oh That's, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's like, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess right now. Yeah. It's the wild west, uh, as they say. And it's, um, yeah, we're trying to navigate an event as, as safely and responsibly 
you know, as our team feels uh, is possible. You know, again, like a lot of it has to do with how much are we going to tax um, our team who, again, you know, we're a tiny group of people who are, are uh, um, mostly volunteers uh, doing this in our free time while producing other events for our day jobs and programming other events. And so a lot of it has to do too when, when you know, as you know, from producing a, a number of events and, and the invitational you've got coming up that like, um, you know, you have to look at how much you can put on your team and how what's the responsible and ethical thing to do, both for your attendees and your audience, and also uh, your volunteer pool and your staff that's coming to work on this, and they're putting their trust in and um, kind of uh, the leadership of the event and and the artists that come, and you don't really want to. Um, uh, uh, you can't uh, do anything that will put them in kind of either harm's way or in a situation where they suddenly have to be uh, medical professionals that they are not qualified to be, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Bummer. With, we, with went, the, we went, bummer, we went to bummer a bummer part, route. Yeah. yeah with, that, with that part done, what's um, and, and, and necessary, right? You know, like, let's, let's be, let's be clear here. What else is on tap? Because the immersive game isn't the only thing uh, that is either immersive or immersive adjacent, as we often say. Uh, yes, yeah. section of the of the festival this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, live is kind of live components are all throughout the festival. Many of them not immersive. You know, much like the film program and the variety we put in there, we we try very much to have a diversity of storytelling styles uh, and events um, for kind of every type of fan. You'll see a number of storytelling and podcast type shows, which don't really apply uh, to the immersive kind of crew. I'll say there's sort of three categories of of, of kind of what could be labeled of interest uh, to the no proscenium and everything immersive gang. And um, uh, the things that are like full on immersive besides the game, uh, I would very much draw your attention to uh, Sharper Teeth catalog uh, from a, a new collective called Dream Video Division or DVD. Uh, they came out of... Um, sort of a pandemic uh, era, um, almost, uh, I want to say, vaporwave style remixing uh, collectives that were popping up on Twitch during kind of the throes of the lockdown, remixing kind of cult favorites and classic movies and not so classic movies and cult films in general. And um, uh, th this new collective is sort of an outpost or, or growth out of some of the folks behind uh, uh, some of these kind of really wonderful um film collective remixing groups that were uh, really kind of creating the closest thing I saw to a sense of community within uh, a certain type of underground cinephile during during the height of lockdown era. And so they're doing two events for us. And the uh, Sharper Teeth catalog is their uh, immersive art installation um, using augmented reality. It is uh, uh, originally kind of drawing inspiration uh, from the idea of Anne Rice's legacy and a true Tribute to her, she had passed away, and it has now grown into uh, kind of a larger vampire style um, kind of uh, installation piece. And so that's more like installation art. You'll see that in our festival hub. It will you'll be able to interact with it throughout the festival, and it will have um, a direct relation to another one of their events, which is something I would call immersive adjacent, and that's Nosferat Two, which is. Uh, their tribute to the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of one of the most important films, either in or out of genre, Nosferatu, uh, after F.W. Murnau's German expressionist classic. Um, and it is um, something a lot of festivals play. I think we've even played it at some point. And we thought if we were going to do a tribute to that, uh, we should do something different and let these folks, uh, uh, these collectives kind of have their chance at what they can do, you know, since we'd enjoyed so much of their remixing work. And um, that one will be in multiple houses on the Friday night of our festival. Uh, you will be able to kind of chat along. It's much more of a social event. Um, and that, and uh, uh, I would say that is more interactive than immersive uh, and much more like kind of a Twitch community style event. But you're, it's going to be a really cool remix and it's going to it's going to work in tandem with the Sharper Teeth catalog installation. Uh, and then readers of your site should know about Welcome Home, which is a really wonderful story box piece from Shine On Collective. I mean, for my money, probably the uh, most impactful 
piece of its type I did during lockdown. Um, I feel like we saw a lot of artists emerge uh, at the start of lockdown uh, to kind of rush to create things for the idea of kind of giving people either hope or a feeling or something fun to do or a connection to each other and immersive art. And uh, I really enjoyed doing a lot of that, but it also felt like um, that was right. That was sort of the text of most of these pieces. And Welcome Home was the first story box that I tried that really felt like it invested me in the story uh, and really kind of stood on its own, not just as a piece of pandemic art, but as something that um, really could be enjoyed, uh, with, you know, without thinking about or being uh, locked down in uh, in in the pandemic. And so uh, when we were rethinking um, how we were going to showcase an uh, immersive work at the festival, this was one of the first things that comes to mind. So, you know, you will be able to reserve pieces if you're a pass holder. This one will have an extra uh, cost to it uh, because one of the things that was important to us in general was lowering passes at the festival because we know that uh, everybody uh, that would come to this kind of event or that we would want to come to this event uh, probably took a pretty big financial hit in the last few years and we don't want to be anyone's barrier to entry um, uh, but the result of doing of lowering that meant that uh, uh, some of these extra pieces would have a small cost to them uh, and so one person uh, will be able to reserve uh, a box and then they can invite how many players they would like to come, you know, it's recommended one or six, one to six people. You can play it on your own time and you can collect them at the beginning of the festival. And we'll have those reservations out uh, after May 10th when we have all the schedules out and the tickets on sale. And um, yeah, that's a piece that if you haven't had a chance to try it or if you are coming to the festival and immersive curious, but not really involved in kind of this scene, that is uh, more than a wonderful gateway to kind of what your appetite um, and so that's Welcome Home. Uh, another piece uh, that your readers uh, and listeners should definitely know about if they don't already is the indie game Norco, which won mm-hmm. the 2021 Games Award from Tribeca last year, the first time they ever put that award uh, in play. Um, there is an incredible LA Times piece that um, uh, Todd Martins uh, wrote uh, uh, calling it the video game of 2022, uh, as well as a masterpiece of interactive storytelling. And um, it is, uh, besides being a very dreamy, dystopian point and click uh, Southern Gothic uh, narrative, also takes place very much in uh, in South Louisiana specifically, and then uh, uh, eventually uh, New Orleans as well. And so it felt like a, a no-brainer to have that um, available and able uh, for folks to play. Uh, the full game is available for purchase, I should say, and I, I think folks who can't make it to the festival should absolutely check it out. It's about 10 to 13 hours of your life that you uh, <laughs> that, that I think will enrich it uh, very deeply. And uh, it's very much in, in line with um, the kind of LucasArts games that I feel like many people who lean towards uh, immersive experiences uh, all either grew up on or gravitate to already. So it's in a language that I think is really attractive to the brain of the immersive enthusiast. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, something we're calling Halloween in June. Uh, it is uh, the kind of thing... Uh, that is sort of based on the uh, immersive party uh, subgenre of uh, experiences, which actually tends to be my personal least favorite style of experience. But I know a lot of people really, really enjoy them. And every now and then you'll see somebody do a really great one. And I, I, I kind of have to eat my words. Um, but this one is not this one is very much more uh, in the style of, I would say, uh, what was that New Year's themed restaurant in Pleasure Island in Disney World or very or more like the Magic Castle, where it's more much more so about uh, the vibe. There will be uh, a world, there will be rituals, but uh, it is not a, a, a pure, it is not in a, a narrative experience to being designed by a group or an individual. It is very much about the idea that we were robbed of a Halloween. Uh, and so we are owed one. So we're having a second one. And this is a full on Halloween party 
as once you enter uh, this space uh, on the final night of our festival, you are, it is Halloween. Um, and all guests will be expected to uh, participate and partake accordingly. Um, so it is a social experiment. Um, it is a respite. I've been listening to um, hours of um, uh, playlists that uh, some obsessive <laughs> collectors uh, uh, have sent our way for use that have been filling me with nothing but joy. Um, and it's meant to be the kind of immersive experience in uh, in in sort of the purest sense of of uh, joy, it is what we designed the festival to be, um, and it was kind of a, a, a it takes us all the way back to what the kind of beginnings of the fest were when we were locked in a haunted house in the middle of nowhere together. So we're we're really excited about that one. So we're going to sneak that in as an immersive adjacent experience. The other live event that I would uh, sort of recommend folks who love immersive go to, but I wouldn't exactly call these immersive events, are uh, two performances. Uh, one is the Pumpkin Pie Show, which has had immersive components in our festival before. So if you've come to our fest, you may have had some one-on-one storytelling experiences with the uh, the author who's a, a novelist, a comics writer, a performer, Clay McLeod Chapman. He's been performing the Pumpkin Pie Show for years. We're bringing back his original show, which we did at our very, very first festival. Um, and, uh, and so that won't be immersive, but if you have been to his immersive shows, you will not want to miss that. And the other is uh, Quintron at the Chamberlain. Uh, Quintron and Miss Pussycat are, are New Orleans legends. They have a very um, specific, eccentric, unique, and amazing show and philosophy to music and puppetry and performance. And Quintron is also a inventor of musical instruments. So while I wouldn't, I, I think I would be lying if I told uh, attendees that this was an immersive event, but if you like immersive events, uh, as, and especially the ones at our festival, you will like this and you should go see him perform at, uh, at his Chamberlain, uh, which is, uh, one of his, um, uh, one of his organs. He'll be using something he calls the drum buddy, which is a light activated coffee can drum machine. And he might have some of his other inventions as well. And if you don't know who Quintron is, you should, you should rectify that, uh, pretty immediately. He, he is a, a highlight of any, any Southern music tour. Um, and I think, I don't, I think if I tried to sell you on any other events, it would outright not be immersive. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a tight little program. And uh, and then we've got a bunch of other types of stories and events and films. And we've got, we got a whole film festival going on. Yeah. You know, so there's 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 plenty to do. You know, Overlook is really perfect for people who love horror, who love horror films and who like immersive or love immersive uh, if, if those if those two great tastes taste great to, together to you, then it's it's the perfect pre midsummer treat. So um, bravo yeah. on that. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Are you are you looking forward to I, with all the pressures, all the things, and, and I I know how hard it is to put together a large scale event. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you uh, are you are you excited? Are you looking forward to doing it? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it's a conversation we had when we pivoted to um, kind of uh, teaming up with a number of other uh, homeless genre festivals and creating this sort of charity driven virtual initiative in these last two years uh, was should we keep doing that? Should we come back at all? You know, it, 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 I think it's a very real question that most regional arts organizations and events are having over and over again now. And, um, you know, the consensus when we put it out to our advisory board and our uh, uh, longtime filmmaker alums and regular attendees uh, was that it did seem like there was a need for it uh, and and with our staff as well, um, you know, because that is the, uh, uh, often the constant question, right? That like, if we're being very realistic, we all have to ask, like, is this worth the work? Is this nine months of planning worth the four days and maybe 10 things that, that a lot of people get to do, uh, and then it's over. Is it worth all that? And it, it seemed to be something that we felt, um, you know, for, for our fan base and for the people that keep wanting to come, uh, 
uh, something that people were excited to do. Uh, and so we decided to pull the trigger and, and do it again. And, um, you know, I have to say, as we're planning it, I'm super glad uh, that we did because it is it is weirder than any other event that I'm lucky enough to work for or run or produce or be part of a program. Um, it's where all the ideas we couldn't uh, sell at some at some of our other events, like kind of get to live and thrive and and have people get excited about suggesting and um it's always fun to have teams iterate and 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 kind of you know come up with better ideas and figure out how to pivot uh you know a i I think it's orson wells who either coined or at least took credit for the line um uh uh the absence of limitations uh is is sort of the enemy of art and uh, that's the line. The enemy of art is the absence of the limitations. And so having these limitations and then having to plan around them, um, it ends up being a thrill in and of itself. That's that's our immersive experience. The people planning this is sort of how we how we do this amidst all the challenges, um, you know, and uh, these kind of trying to trying to have very strict safety measures has been a very unique challenge in and of itself and still produce event that we feel our audience wants to see, but that we can also still feel like we're responsible for uh, and, and, and feel as ethical as possible while uh, putting them on for people. People are in good hands with you uh, as best, as best as anyone can do it. I know you're going <laughs> to, you're going to strive for it. Uh, having, having traveled with you uh, by car during pandemic with us both masked up and, and all, of the, all of the things we've done in order to like maintain ourselves and yet still uh, pursue, you know, yeah. P- I mean, pursue our really callings, exciting. you know, like we, we, you, you find a way you're even, you're even more <laughs> hardcore about this than I am. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Landon, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in and telling us all about the immersive set overlook this year. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing people's uh, field reports uh, from, from the festival this year. Yeah. Come down to new Orleans and uh, uh, you know, see, see what it's been up to. It's, uh, you know, very much still a thriving city. And that's the show this week. I want to thank Caesar. I want to thank Landon for being our guests on the show. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you uh, also for, for everyone who has been uh, who, who's uh, put a little review on iTunes for us. Uh, we actually, uh, we average pr- pretty well. Uh, so, uh, but if you could take a moment to go do that, if this show is valuable to you, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what to, to put in, but if you can also write a little note as part of it, that'd be great. Uh, uh, the, the, the last note we have in there is actually a negative review calls us uh, borderline insufferable, which is awesome. Uh, and just, uh, actually gets me fired up so that's why i'm actually asking now it's like oh could you go uh bury that one for me thanks uh <laughs> watch a bunch of you go in is like yeah borderline insufferable what do you mean borderline it's totally insufferable anyway um look i just got back from uh from a whirlwind trip out to las vegas uh i drove out on wednesday caught the show wednesday night uh, went over to uh, check out some more stuff at Area 15 on Thursday. And like I mentioned, drop in on Majestic Rep. I'm going to write up a lot of notes about that. There'll be a full review of Particle Ink Speed of Dark. Uh, there'll also be uh, capsule reviews of uh, the Lost Spirits Distillery in next week. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we, I did a lot about Speed of Dark. So uh, take that as read. I do want to pause for a second. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, we did uh, a video of the Lost Spirits Distillery uh, here in L.A. That's the the rebuild because, of course, the original version uh, burned uh, and they, they moved the operation. Uh, now in Vegas, uh, it is it's got a lot of the same aesthetic. It's got the vibe, but it's a totally different beast. Um, I was in there yesterday on a Thursday at like five o'clock in the afternoon. They were, uh, there was, there was just, there was 
burlesque and cabaret and acrobatic performers kind of just roaming and and uh, going into like spaces and like doing a quick performance and like every hour on the hour like you know there's a number that happens and there's a carnival barker is like moving from like stage to stage and drawing attention and i'll put some some of the videos up uh on our feeds next week but i was really just um impressed uh like i said uh, at the top of the show real quick uh it reminds me of the magic castle but in instead of it being all magicians it's like all these different types of acts it's like it's like vaudeville uh but free roam and there's little stations with like you know booze everywhere so um obviously it's not for everybody but if those sorts of things are your jam um really worth checking out it's like a 65 five dollar ticket uh, you get little five pours out of that and you get all the entertainment. <sighs> if you're going to be over at area 15, right? You know, check out Meow Wolf, check out that. What a weekend. Um, uh, check out Particle Inc. Speed of Dark, uh, over in the arts district. Um, Majestic Rep's got a show. Swing through that. Grab yourself a slice at Good Pie across the street from Majestic Rep. They've got a great grandma, uh, pizza slice. Uh, it's just, you know, it's. Vegas off the strip is a real thing. And, uh, I had some of the most fun I've had in, in a while, uh, a couple of years actually, uh, in the last 48 hours. So I'm kind of, I'm jazzed and juiced. And at the heart of it all is particle ink speed of dark, uh, which, which I will definitely be headed back out to, to check out again. Uh, not immediately, uh, that's what I take care of. And you know, the money supply is an infinite, you should know you pay for this show. Um, you can all check the Patreon. It's like, how do you live that way? It's like, it's called a loan. And one day it's going to come due. So patreon.com slash no proscenium, uh, because, uh, the government will have its way with me, uh, starting around March of next year. So thanks. Need the help. Um, it is an exciting time and immersive right now though. Uh, there's, there's, there's new work. There's new visions, new possibilities. Um, and, uh, and, and good work work that's got a heart, uh, work that's got ingenuity, work that's putting performers to work. Um, I, I, the time we're in, in the macro sense, is just continues to be awful and horrendous. Uh, so it, it gives me uh, solace to know that there is something worth being here for and it's it's all of this and all of that is made possible by all of you um want to thank our latest patreon backers uh james matthew martin and Louis alvarez shot uh this uh, means we're up to 366 backers at the moment there's always a little bit of churn uh and uh 2319 a month i mentioned <laughs> that's yeah that's that's my income baby <sighs> Try not to think about it too much. Um, this month, we want to move the needle up just a little bit to 375 backers. So we're looking for nine new backers at the $5 or more level uh, to keep us on track, to keep uh, to keep the agents off my back. Uh, we remain completely community funded. Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to do everything we can to get the nonprofit wing up and official. Uh, and, and there's more on that, hopefully, in a couple of months. Got to deal with some lawyers and get that. But we're, we're smoothing that out. The sustaining backers of No Persinium, they are Ari Hurstan, Chris Woolman, Eric Shamlin, Deborah Robinson, Elaine J. Bushman, Jerome Joseph Gentis, David Bassick, Lonnie Hanson, Mark Baltazar, Sidney Guillory, and Jan Budman. You keep me alive. The associate producer of this show is Parker Sella. Music for No Persinium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society. Special thanks to Shimano Lachlan for voicing our intro. And I'm responsible for the message that is this podcast. Thank you all. Um, keep those masks on. Uh, it's uh, it's getting choppy out there again. Uh, I I was running around. Uh, I kept my mask on anytime I was indoors in Las Vegas, and when I was outside uh, and talking to people, I had it off. And am I a little nervous right now? Uh huh. I am. I am. I am a little nervous. Trying try not to think that every little thing is is the beast coming for me, uh, but. Um, Hopefully it it uh, it doesn't and uh, and 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 this is uh, proof that we can go and do the fun things and we can do them safely. All right. Hope to see a whole bunch of you at the immersive invitational next week. We will be requiring masks for audience members, so bring your good one, bring your mask, bring your ninety fives. Okay. 
uh and uh and it's gonna be it's gonna be a blast uh and there's a whole bunch of stuff happening here in la and in new york everybody's popping off let's get this going let's get let's get immersive back into the full swing all right letting you go i've been noah nelson and until next time i will see you at the show <laughs>